There we go. Ah. You never realize how dirty your glasses are until you have a really bright light shine directly in your face and then all of the little particles of dust pop up. Okay. Audio sounds good, so we're going to turn that off. Okay. All right. I don't know how many people are going to be in here to view, but this is pretty much just going to be me talking to camera. I did a little bit of... um. A little bit of editing and stuff on the desktop last time. But this time it's just going to be me and you guys, one-on-one -on -one here. So, um, I don't know if anybody's in, but anybody who's watching, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into chat, and I will address them at the end of the sections so that I can keep things more or less organized. And at the very end, I'll do some Q&A if there's anybody in who has any further questions. So, let's begin. Let me turn on my headings. All right. Part one. What do you want to record? Because when it comes to equipment, different equipment is good for different purposes. So if you want to, starting at the lowest tier, just do teleconferencing or gaming, you know, just talk to your friends while you're gaming or talk to people over Skype, Discord, any other kind of VoIP service, it's a really low standard. Like, you just have to be intelligible. They have to be able to understand what you're saying. Doesn't necessarily have to sound good. Just doesn't have to sound so bad they can't understand you. So, you know, most VoIP and phone systems are going to crush down the audio so bad that no matter how good it is, it's still going to sound nah, not great. So just get a comfortable headset or a USB mic that is easy enough to use. Um... Make sure it's close enough that it can hear your voice before the reflections around the room get into the mic. So they're still going to get in there if you're recording without any treatment or anything. But as long as your voice gets in there first, they'll at least be able to understand you. Moving on, YouTube, Twitch, any kind of video thing like this where you want to stream or you want to do YouTube or whatever... It's a middling standard. People expect a little more, and in reality, the audio is a lot more important than the video because they're going to be watching it on a phone that has a tiny little screen with headphones, which sound a lot better than the speakers. So audio is a lot more important than the video. As long as you sound good, you can go a lot further than if you look great but don't sound great. So... Some treatment would be useful, you know, a little bit of things here and there to block out some of the reflections. But honestly, people kind of like a more organic sound. They don't like it to sound too processed and stuff because they want it to sound more casual. So keep it relaxed, you know, make it so that it sounds like a real place, but not like it sounds bad, necessarily. As long as you're intelligible, you should be fine. Uh, you know, as long as you have light treatment and a good mic, it'll go a long way. And I'll get into treatment and mics and everything later. This is just explaining what you should look for in your specific purpose. The main focus is going to be on voiceover because it's the highest standard. And if you want to go that far, then you can. And it won't be a problem. You know, it's just going to cost more. And it'll sound good, but uh, you might not necessarily have to, especially if it's not something you're expecting to pay back dividends because it's not necessarily a business. Next podcast. This says middle to high standard. You can get away with worse audio. It doesn't have to be professional because some people, again, are okay with a casual sound. But the worse your sound is, the less likely people are willing to tolerate it. So unless your content is great, you want to have at least decent sound. In, if your content is amazing, people will tolerate kind of crappy sound. Look at the Mega64 podcast a while ago. You know, they sound better now, but in the past they've had like really bad stuff because it's a video podcast, so they expect you to watch that and not listen to it. So their audio has improved, but it didn't matter because it was a really fun show. A lot of people were huge fans, so it was okay. But keep that in mind. There's there's a balance there. Proper placement is a must. And this is with all 
audio, really, even if you have no treatment, proper placement can help a great deal. And I'll go into more detail about what proper placement is later. But some solid treatment would also be great if you're doing a podcast. It's all audio, so you want it to sound its best, you know. And so go as high as you can. But don't worry too much, especially if it's not, like, a serious podcast. If it's something that's supposed to be a funny idea or something that you're just having with friends, you don't have to go too crazy. If it's supposed to be, like, an industry podcast, you're supposed to look like a professional. Having bad audio makes you look less credible, no matter how credible you might be. So, at the same time, though, you can see stuff like uh, the Magic the Gathering Drive to Work cast, where one of the designers from Magic the Gathering just puts a mic on his dashboard and records himself talking as he drives to work. The content is really good, and it's from a person with a ton of expertise, so the fact that the audio isn't great, because it's just on a car dashboard, at least in the early episodes, it's fine. It works out. Hmm. Vocals for music. So, this totally depends on the genre. In fact, there's a whole genre now that's gained a ton of popularity, lo-fi, where having bad audio is actually kind of the idea, and a lot of it's roughing up the audio in post. So you can use whatever space and do whatever you like, really. Like, a big part of the expression is how you decide to work your vocals. You could even find places that have really interesting reverb, Sometimes you want dry recordings and you add artificial reverb. Sometimes you want natural reverb that you can't really deal with later. Music is different. You know, it's it's very textural. It has a lot more room to wiggle around. Again, as long as they can understand you and it sounds good, it can work. Like, this is a much more um, non-standardized thing with the vocals for music. Like, obviously pop music and stuff but then you can look at Billie Eilish won a ton of Grammys and she just had a crappy little like hundred dollar mic and like Logic Pro and those songs are great and they won a lot of awards so you can get by with cheaper stuff if you know what you're doing filmmaking again similar to music this one is dependent on what your artistic direction is Do you want it to be something that sounds more natural, like you're in the room, or more polished, like something you'd see on TV? So it really depends how high you want to do it. At the very least, you want to at least sound like you're people in a room, not people talking to a camera, exactly. And there's a lot more to say on that. I'm not going to get into that so much. Um, Recording for film is definitely very different from recording for voiceover. But when you're doing ADR, when you have to re-record stuff later that might have gotten garbled or you decide to rewrite later, you kind of want to go to VO standards for that because you're just going to be in a booth doing stuff and then just kind of mimic whatever environment you were in when you recorded it in post and in placement and stuff. So there's a lot to be said there too. Voiceover. Voiceover is going to be the main focus, as I said, and it is a high standard. It's a very high standard. Whether you're doing it professionally or as a hobby, the standard is to have 98% dry audio at the very least. You want it to have a tiny bit wet, because if it's fully dry, it sounds a little weird and artificial, so you want a little bit of bounce so that it sounds real, but... Yeah, it's really, really high standard. If you want to get into voiceover, you got to be able to, like, pony up for the best standard that you can do. So just be sure that you're not selling yourself short on your audio. Because no matter how good you are, if your audio isn't up to standard, you're getting passed over for someone whose audio is. If someone has good audio and they're a good enough performer, they're going to prefer that to someone who has terrible audio and is a great performer because the good audio is going to be less work for them in the long run and it's going to sound better for their product. So you want to make sure that you get the best audio that you can and you want it to sound as little like it's in a room as possible. You want it to sound like you're in kind of a void, basically, like no reverb, no nothing, just you your voice existing outside of yourself, if that makes sense. It's kind of confusing. The standards are very high, is my point. Also, 
sidebar, if you are doing it as a hobby, the idea of a hobby is that you enjoy the activity, and part of an activity, really any activity that you're doing on your own, is learning to do it. So why is there so much apprehension towards just studying? Like looking stuff up, doing research. I see a lot of people who don't want to do research because they're like, oh, I'm just doing it as a hobby. It's like, well, don't you want to do it right then? Like that's, in my experience, if you're doing a hobby, you do it to do it well, or at least to like learn as much as you can about it and like enjoy it that way. So I don't, I don't really get the, the, the mindset of not wanting to study up on something at the start for sure and throughout like confuses me but i digress that's a sidebar let me get a little water here and we're gonna switch over in just a second no questions in the chat yet and if there's not a lot of views on this whatever i'm gonna post it up on youtube later it'll be on demand anybody who isn't watching it it's their loss I'm making good content here, and y'all are not doing it. Um, let me just double check. Uh, what can I say? Quick check. Can you hear me? <clears throat> okay. Check that out, and then we're going to move on to the next part, the equipment hierarchy. So, excuse me, I typed that out. Oh, I guess that's a global command, huh? Okay. <coughs> excuse me. So, the equipment hierarchy. There are three major considerations when it comes to recording audio. In fact, just a moment, I'm going to... Make this a little easier for me to read. Okay. Okay, there are three major considerations when it comes to recording audio. Your environment, that's the space around you that you're recording in, and the fact that you have to record here on Earth, not in some vacuum out in space. So there are considerations for how the sound is going to react. Your interface, which is to say the thing that connects your microphone to your um hmm the thing i put in the chat is not showing up that's odd i am going to remove the chat for now cuz it's doing some strange things i'm not sure what's up with that <clears throat> actually let me check on my phone Dashboard. Hmm. That's odd. If you can hear me, uh, put a message in chat. I want to make sure that this is actually like working correctly. Um, the chat on my screen keeps refreshing every couple minutes, so that's odd. Uh, unfortunate, but if I have to move along. <clears throat> then I have to move along. My audio should be working, so. Let's see. Right. So the interface, this is what's going to connect your microphone to your computer. It should be a separate thing from your microphone. Connecting your microphone straight to your computer with a USB cable is... We'll get into that, so... Ah, uh, yes, I am going to uh, get into your questions at the end of the section here, but I will get into that. Thank you, uh, what was it? What we got? Brian. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> okay, so your mic, and it goes in that order. Your environment is going to be a huge determiner in the quality of your audio. Your interface is going to be a smaller but still very substantial part of your audio, and your mic is pretty minor actually like determiner of your audio quality we i will get into the fact that there is still a bar to it but you can do pretty well with a decent mic and great on the others but we'll get into that quite a bit here 
The thing to keep in mind with audio quality is it's not just like a direct spectrum from good to bad. Think of it like soil quality. Sometimes you want sandy, like desert soil for certain plants, and sometimes you want just full-on mud for your plants. It depends on what your purpose is, so depending on what you're doing, the quality is just the character, the specific feel to the sound, and some work better for others. If you want to control the quality of your audio, you're going to need to address it from environment to interface to microphone. If you have a great environment and a good interface, you can make a decent mic sound fantastic. Some mics are not up to the standard. Like, there is a lower standard that you still have to meet. But as long as those other things are there, you can make a fairly affordable mic sound really good. So that's the hierarchy, and then we're going to get into each of those one by one here, but uh, I just wanted to answer this question real quick. Just scoot that out of the way. So need a new interface strictly for VO, only one channel needed, suggestions. Well, I'm actually going to get into that in part four here, so if you keep watching, I will uh, answer that in just a few minutes. So first off, we're going to go environment. So, your environment is the most important thing for your audio quality. To control your environment is to control how your audio is going to sound. First things first, you need to get your isolation in order. This is what most people would consider soundproofing. It's keeping outside noises out of your space and out of your recordings, and keeping all of your inside noises, that is, your voice or music if you're recording music, in your recording. The only reliable way to isolate is with thick, dense material. Thick, dense mass is what you need. The best thing would be just, like, concrete. Like, just a thick wall with, like, air cushions in it. If you can, because I know you're probably recording from home, and you can't get to a professional studio where they have done that and taken the thousands of dollars it does to do that, you can get a professionally fabricated booth. And it's ideal. It will keep out so much noise. It's also usually in the thousands of dollars, so a lot of people can't afford that. Even used, they can be like one to $2,000. So if you don't have that kind of budget, some alternatives. First, find a quiet place in your house. As many walls between you and the outside as possible, away from large appliances or roads, and remember, air is a great insulator when it's contained into a cushion. So if there's a wall, a bunch of air, another wall, that's a good insulator. That will keep out noise. So usually, the go-to is a closet as close to the center of the house as you can get. They're not ideal, but they're a start. They're a form that you can use. Now, things to consider. The doors. A lot of doors in houses are going to be hollow core. It's just empty, which means that not only is it not keeping as much noise out, but your sound can actually get in there and bounce around and make some really weird frequencies that are hard to control. So replacements would be a solid core door, which is just full solid wood, no air, but they're really expensive, hundreds of dollars. An audio blanket. And I don't mean a moving blanket, that's not the same thing. Sometimes they're labeled as that, but that's not what they're for. They're for cushioning your things so that they don't get banged up during moving. What you want is an audio blanket. The one I know is uh, from Audimute, but I feel like there are other brands. That's just the one I'm familiar with. And it's just three layers thick, tons of air, very thick, and it can cut about 20 decibels, which might be all you need. A lot of times, you're only within that 20 decibel range from the noise floor you want, which is about negative 60, negative 50 maybe. Negative 60 is the broadcast standard, but you can get away with negative 50. So if you have at least negative 30, if you get one of these blankets, you can get down even lower to where you need to be. Let's see. Windows. Windows to the outside. So if your windows are just to the outside and they're single paned they can let a lot of noise in and they can let a lot of noise out but 
noise out is not as big a problem there unless you're shouting and stuff, so don't worry about that as much. Um, one moment. Gotta drink some water. Mm. Spilled that all over my face. That's embarrassing. Ah. <coughs> this this wide mouth. I don't really care for that as much, but I do like that it's insulated. Regardless, stay hydrated. Now, you can get double or triple paned windows, and they will keep out a ton of noise. But again, they are very expensive, and you usually have to get them professionally installed, which is more cost. So what you can do instead is get Lexan. It's hard, clear plastic, and it's just in a sheet, and you can just push that against the window, uh, stick it up with putty or something, do whatever you can to get it up there, seal the window off, and that'll add an air cushion and another pane. If you don't care about seeing through it, stuff it full of insulation. That'll be even more insulating and isolating. So those are some options. Another option is a homemade booth. Only do this if you know what you're doing, because if you're making like a full whisper room style booth and you don't ventilate it properly, you can suffocate or it can get packed with deadly black mold, which can destroy your voice and kill you. So yeah, don't do it unless you know how to ventilate properly. Despite that, even if you make it correctly, I've heard a lot of poorly made booths that people think sound amazing. Make sure a professional, someone who works in audio professionally, full time, um, you need to have them listen to a recording from your booth so that they can tell you if it sounds good. Because if you are just making it yourself and you don't work in audio, you can't be certain that you know. And you don't want to think that you're sounding great when in reality you're looking like a fool because everybody recognizes that your booth isn't sounding up to code or standard. But in the end, a whisper room is just an MDF box with fabric and like a lot of joints and stuff. So if you can make an MDF box and you have the skills and you know how to do it safely, the materials are like 500 to 700 bucks. Uh, you could also just get a couple of MDF boards, like sheets, eight by four foot, and hinge them together. Maybe make like, put it into the corner of a room so that you make a box. Maybe put them together into like their own booth and put an audio mute blanket over top. Those can work. Those are options. Um, but it's kind of a pain to have a removable booth. So keep that in mind. Having something semi-permanent is a lot more useful. <clears throat> One thing that will not work, and I know people are going to argue with me on this, Moving blanket booths, they do not work. Every time I hear one, and I hear audio from one, or hear somebody talking about them, I immediately ask for a recording. And when I hear them, they're doing nothing. I'm sorry, like, if you think it sounds great, again, you are not listening correctly because it sounds terrible. It sounds like you didn't do anything. If you layer, like, three or more moving blankets... It might do something, but the single moving blanket does not do it. It does not work. The next thing, isolation boxes. That is a lie. I don't know where they got that name, but they do not isolate. They don't keep any sound out. They don't keep any sound in. They don't even treat very well. Like The idea is that it's just a box that has foam in it, but your microphone is not making the noise. You are. So it has to treat you and the space around you, not the space in your mic. Because once it gets into the mic, it's already bounced around all the walls. So you can't just, you can't just have a box full of foam and hope that it's going to sound like an actual booth. Because it's not. It's going to do nothing. At best, it will muffle your mic a bit. So yeah, don't. They're a waste of money. Even at just like 40 bucks or whatever they are. I had one for a while. I didn't know what I was doing. I sounded terrible. Once I figured things out, I felt so embarrassed that I actually sent out auditions from that thing. Do not get an isolation booth. Or an isolation box. Isolation booths? Good. Isolation box? Total lie. Marketing 
mumbo mumbo jumbo or whatever <coughs> excuse me okay so now your space is isolated you have a good noise floor no background noise coming from the outside or at least a very very tiny amount and all of your sound is staying in so that your sound can be controlled you're not having to worry about it getting out and coming back in in an uncontrolled way so now you have to do treatment acoustic treatment is about changing the shape of the environment to stop the sound waves you don't want from getting into the recording so how they do this in hollywood is with the same kind of things you can do at home with you know uh, different materials and different panels or in some cases they'll just create rooms that are very strangely shaped in a way that will break up the waves so that they don't mess with the audio that costs tens of thousands of dollars the rooms you have to work with are rectangular prisms of varying sizes if you're lucky you might get a weirdly shaped room i'm lucky enough this door back here is at a 45 degree angle but that doesn't mean that much so it helps a little bit but not nearly enough for what for doing voiceover in this room which is why i don't do voiceover in this room i do it in the booth back here I just do streams and YouTube from here. So, <clears throat> uh, yes, I'm gonna actually mention the audience ID, well, the ID 14, but not the, but I will uh, do that in the next section here. But it is a good choice, that is a good example. So, what you can do is to change the shape of your room you can add to your hard flat walls. The most common waves you're gonna get are standing waves, which just reflect back and forth from different parallel hard surfaces. Your voice hits one wall, bounces to the other one, and creates a really bad standing wave that sounds really muddy and weird. You don't want it. To stop that, you'll wanna put some baffling between the surfaces to cushion it on one or both ends. So if it's going from this wall to that wall, Put treatment on that wall or put treatment on that wall or spread out treatment in a way so that all of the surfaces over here like half of the surfaces here are covered spread out then the other half are spread out over there so there's no parallel surfaces that's where you're going to get those waves um also this wall to that wall ceiling to floor basically those three dimensions as long as you put some baffling on either end or both if you can that would be ideal you can get better audio stuff that doesn't sound so muddy and reverberant so things that will work to do that thick dense fabrics the audio moot blankets I talked about earlier uh, layered quilts comforters moving blankets like layered I'm saying like three plus thick as many as you can to get like because once the sound hits it it will still keep going the idea is that it will be slowed so when it hits the wall behind it and comes back, it's slowed again so that it won't be able to get back to your sound. But you got to make sure there's a good amount to be able to do something about it. Pillows and cushions are pretty good, especially in like corners and things. They can be used as base traps or just specifically corner baffles. I have uh, pillows in quite a few of the corners in here because for the most part, like I said, I record in this booth and it's very well treated. Small bits of sound will get out here. But then this is lightly treated enough so that it will stop the sound from bouncing back into the booth unless i'm like screaming at the top of my lungs sometimes i am because voiceover stuff that you do um another thing would be fiberglass or mineral mineral wool also called rock sole or rock wool you need to cover this in fabric because it can flake off and it's very hard and sharp and if you breathe it in it will cut your lungs up and cut your throat up um, I am not going to be able to take the webcam because it's attached to my computer but if you go to uh, I'm actually going to do a studio tour this coming week like I'm, I'm working on that so it will be all in there and I'm going to go into deep detail about it because I reworked a couple things in there so watch out for that on my YouTube channel which is youtube.com slash user slash Iggy and the ape and you can see that and you can also see my other stuff which is not necessarily for voiceover but 
other things in here. I, I, it's a working space and a living space because it's my bedroom, but I've done a lot to make it be efficient and utilitarian. So, fiberglass mineral wool is going to be great. It's thick, it's dense, uh, and it, if you can get enough of it, it's pricey, but if you can get enough of it to put in places, like that will be the ideal treatment. Another thing you can do, because again, this is about fixing up the shape, is textured uneven surfaces because it's only going to bounce off of hard, smooth walls. If you break up the shape of the wall, the sound waves are going to break up and scatter so that they are not going to have that really clear reverberant sound. It still might have some reverb if you do this, but it will at least go some way to doing it. So bookshelves with like a lot of uneven books all over them. Uh, various furniture that's not lined up neatly or anything can help. Uh, things like that. Sound panels, you can get prefabricated, which are pricey, but worth it. And again, same sort of thing. Those ones you'd want to just spread out evenly and make sure that they're just blocking the parallel surfaces and things. You can also get ones that hang off the ceiling and stuff, which are very useful because um, that creates a little air cushion. You can make them by hand, but again, make sure a pro listens to your handmade ones to make sure they're actually working. The really cheap method that some people do, and this is good if you're in a pinch. One more. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been really dried out lately. I, I don't know what's up. I drink a lot of water. Might be washed out on my electrolytes. But uh, a blanket over yourself technically works. However, it's a huge pain. It's really uncomfortable for long periods of time, really limits your posture and placement, and placement can go a long way to making your audio sound good, so you might not even necessarily need the blanket. Um, and it can rub against the mic, and that makes this kind of sound. You don't want that. That sounds bad. So you probably don't want to record under a blanket for the most part. It only works if you're speaking very quietly directly into the microphone, maybe for a bit of narration or something like that. But for most of those things, you're going to be recording for quite a while, so you'll get very uncomfortable. And while this technically will work because it will be quiet enough to not break through the blanket, bounce back in and everything, I wouldn't recommend it because it's very uncomfortable. And it doesn't always work. You have to have a really thick blanket. It's going to get hot too. So a lot of things. Although... If you make your space correctly, it's going to get hot regardless because it's insulated now. So it's going to hold in a lot of heat. If your booth is not getting warm, it might be a sign that it's not actually working effectively. So keep that in mind. Things that won't work. Audio foam. Most audio foam is too thin and your voice will just break through it and sidebar a big pet peeve is when I'm watching a YouTube video I see this with Markiplier specifically he is the one that I'm always thinking of you can see behind them they have one cluster like they show on the Amazon page of just like 12 panels in just one spot on the wall and that's it they're not doing anything they're blocking like a tiny bit of the reverb but nothing else you have to spread them out or have more like, I don't, I don't know why they think that that's doing anything. Like, you put it up and listen. D does it sound different? It doesn't. But they don't notice because they aren't actually paying attention to the audio. It's frustrating. You can use audio foam again if you're doing quieter stuff like narration. But if you're doing character work, it's not going to work too great. And if you're doing even high energy narration where you're talking about something like for kids, that's not going to work because it's going to bust through that foam and do very little, especially if you're doing instruments. Not very useful. Um, oh, yeah, I'll say quickly, uh, the egg crate thing as well, that's a music thing. That is not a that is not a voiceover thing. It w can work in shaping the reverb, but it does not kill reverb. So keep that in mind. The egg crate thing does not work. Um, for, for professional voiceover, or really most hobby voiceover, because... So many hobbyists already have great audio, so if you don't, you're not going to be able to get many roles or anything. So keep that in mind. Um, isolation box, already talked about that. It doesn't contain the sound since it's coming from outside of the space. You're talking here. The b box is there. 
your voice is bouncing all around and then going into the box, so it's not doing anything. It's not. Porta booth, a little better, but you have to stick your head way into it. And I know you can. They're like big enough that you can like stick your whole face in it. Uh -huh. uh, I will be putting this up on YouTube and it will be up for video on demand. So if you missed anything, you can watch it later. Brian, um, where was I? Right, Porta booth. If you stick your face directly in it, and again, you're being very quiet, it can work in a pinch. But it's not going to work for most applications, and it's not an all-in-one solution. You're going to want to, like, th put a blanket over yourself going back, preferably a really thick blanket, preferably an audio mute blanket if you can get it. God, I'm so mushmouthed today. I apologize. Ugh, need some more water. Um, but yeah, it's it's not going to work for a lot of applications. Next is the reflection shield. You'll still see these. They're the thing that goes around the back of the mic. That's not actually for voiceover. It's it's for singing. Um, and it doesn't do a lot. It, it can do a little bit. But you need to still do something behind yourself. And preferably for the ceiling or the floor. But if you already have the rest of the space treated lightly, this can help. It can do a little bit. But it's not its own thing. You gotta add on to it. Eyeball cover. These are a newer thing where it's just a big old foam ball with a pop filter socketed into it that you just pop on the mic. Uh, not only does this not contain any reflections, the pop filter doesn't let you put your face in it, so it's not going to work for that. And the material is so thick that it actually might muffle the mic, which is not what you want at all. That, that would be awful. So that's not a great solution. So I would say do not get the eyeball covers in general. Uh, they're very pricey and not super useful unless you already have the space treated, at which point you don't really need it. So, I don't know why you would want to get it. Okay. Um, so, now we're going to get into interfaces. And I will mention, specifically the Audient ID 4 that uh, you mentioned in the chat, but uh, also some other ones here. So, part 4, your interface. So, Main things to keep in mind, inputs. You need it, one XLR input for VO, maybe some line in for instruments and stuff if you're doing something else, but for VO, you need one input. Needs to have phantom power if it's a condenser mic, because if it doesn't, it's gonna sound way too quiet and you won't be able to hear it at all. If even that, well, okay. Condenser mics basically work, they have a charge in them, so they are constantly charged, and then there are fluctuations in the actual charge that it records, that's how they work. Whereas dynamic mics, they have a coil and a magnet, I believe, that moves in such a way that that creates it, but it's a lot quieter because you have to be pretty loud to actually get it to move. So, Make sure you have an XLR input. Make sure you have phantom power. Outputs. Probably going to be USB. Most of them are. And just make sure that, for the most part, while you can get USB powered, make sure that it's actually going to have enough voltage because some of them say they're USB powered and then they actually don't have very good voltage, so it doesn't work out in the end. All right. Preamps and converters. So... All interfaces are going to have these. The preamp boosts the audio coming in before sending it to the converter because you're getting a small signal. And then the preamp jacks it up so that it's actually audible. And then it sends it to the converter. If you have a cheap preamp, it's going to add a lot of noise when it's bumping it up. It won't just bump up you. It'll bump up a bunch of electrical noise, a bunch of other stuff. A good preamp is one that will not add much noise and will get you nice and loud. Then it sends it to the converter. The converter turns the analog audio coming in into a digital signal that it sends to the computer through USB. Um, so you want to make sure that that is good because if it's not, it's going to make it sound more digital. You want it to sound as analog and real as possible. If you bypass the USB and just have like a stereo out to your computer, it's going to use your computer's converter 
because it's going from the audio input into the computer's converter. And most computers don't have great audio converters, so I would really suggest using the, the USB uh, over that. Unless you have a really nice computer and you're sure that it has a good converter. All right. Um, make sure it works with your computer. Some, uh, some interfaces are Mac only and some are PC only. So make sure you do your research. <clears throat> make sure that it's not outdated for your computer. Some current computers can't do older interfaces. Like if you get an early... Uh, Apollo, I believe, uh, they don't work with the current Mac framework, or framework, the Mac software. So you do not want to get that because it won't work for you. So some good choices. What I saw there was Audient ID4. Thanks for mentioning that, June. It's June, right? Yeah, June. Hey. Uh, sorry, it's a very small on the chat, and it's all different colors that are kind of hard to read. But uh, yes, so... The Audient ID4 is a good choice. It's got just the, the single input. It's USB powered. It's solid. I like Audient. They make some good stuff. Another common one is the Scarlett 2i2. This is probably on the lower end of the budget. You shouldn't go much lower than this. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, the... the the adapters. I have the the current MacBook that just has four, four, uh, USB C ports. So I have so many dongles and things that I have to plug everything into because I don't have any standard ports. So it's I I know all about the the converters and the adapters and stuff. But uh, Scarlett Two I Two works i'd say it's it's definitely the the lowest you should go with your budget it's a little over 100 bucks if you, most interfaces that are under 100 bucks new are not going to cut it. it maybe someday in the future but right now that's pretty much the low bar it's you should be spending at least 100 bucks on on an interface if you're getting it new persona studio i see this one used pretty often and it works as well it works quite well uh what i use the audient id 14 it's great. It has a couple of XLR inputs that are also uh, line inputs and stuff. It's actually like powered with its own uh, dedicated power. I like it a great deal. It sounds very good, has great converters and preamps. It's a little pricier. So, you know, if you're not planning on doing extra, which I am doing extra because I have a mic here, I have a mic in the booth, I wanted at least two inputs. And in fact, I thought about doing the 22 because it has more inputs, but this is enough for me. But if you just want the one input, the ID4 is probably enough. Uh, there's also the Apollo Twin, and I believe the Apollo Solo. And that's just how many inputs, one input, two inputs. Those are Mac-specific, but they are really good, and they're really user-friendly. It's just a single knob. It's supposed to be really good. And all the audio I hear used with them sounds great. So those are all some good choices. Shop around. You know, don't cheap out. Watch reviews. Make sure you're getting something really good. Oh, your focus rate has not been so good. Okay. Um, hmm. Focus rate. Uh, the, like I said, it's you don't want to cheap out. And I'm pretty sure the focus rate solo is like a sub $100 uh, interface, right? Um, I'm not as familiar with that one. But, yeah. If you cheap out, you're just going to be fighting with your interface. And that's no fun. I feel bad for folks who have to deal with that um, because it's just, it's it's frustrating. I did that for years. I kept buying cheap interfaces and I never understood. I, I had good mics. Why isn't it sounding good? It was the interface. It was bottlenecking my quality and making my audio sound terrible. So don't cheap out and don't screw yourself over with a cheap interface. <clears throat> a quick aside about USB mics. They don't need an interface. They just plug straight into the computer. That's because the interface is built in. The preamp and the converter are in the microphone, and they go to the USB out, and it uh, technically makes sound. This is why they usually sound bad, <laughs> because if you're spending a hundred bike, if you're spending a hundred bucks on a mic and an interface, 
compressed down to fit into the mic. Like, a small interface could probably work, but not if it's part of a mic that's already a budget, so the quality is going to suffer. There are some USB mics that are okay, and I'll get into that, but they're usually at a price point where it's like you may as well have just gotten a decent XLR and a decent interface instead. That being said, I'm going to take a quick break before I get into the mic section here, so I will be right back. Let me, uh... AFK. Ah! There we go. And... Okay, uh, looks like, let me check through the chat here real quick. I just checked in the bathroom mirror and like my lips have been so chapped lately that they're kind of splitting. I hope that isn't showing up on the video. Ugh, it's pretty rough. Mm. Yeah, any mic that comes in a pa or rather not a mic, uh, any interface that comes in a package, they're they're skimping somewhere. Usually, you can find like this something good with a bunch of cheap stuff added on to add value, but uh, yeah, doesn't end up sounding great. Mmm. Yikes. Uh, laptop. If you can, if you can afford it, get a refurbished Mac because Mac's infrastructure just is better like the for uh, audio work or really any work that involves a lot of external devices, whereas Windows has a lot of fiddly stuff to try and get any kind of microphones and stuff to work. Most things with Mac, if you just plug it in, it's good to go. So I find it a lot more... Um, useful for that and it's also just a better like more user-friendly interface it takes a bit to learn the things in here and there i i took a minute and i only got it as a gift which is why i got it and i don't think i'm going to go back to pc outside of like gaming honestly because it's the mac just it, it's better it, it just works so much better um 
I'm going to get into the budget for this equipment specifically in the uh, the second to last section here. So watch for that because I will explain, you know, what about you should expect to spend on stuff. So we'll get into that in just a few sections here. Uh, but I'm going to get back into it here. So. Uh, da, da, da. Mic. Okay, the microphone. Like I said... This is like the, the least important thing for your quality, really. If you have a good interface, like a decent interface and great treatment, then you don't have to go crazy on the mic. You still got to get a decent mic. It, it can't be the cheapest thing, but you can go decent. So we're going to go through the different types of mics. They come in a lot of different shapes. You have the large diaphragm condenser and tube style condenser mics, which I lump together because they function pretty pretty similarly. Um, like the, oh, it's in my booth. Uh, the MXL 990, I'm a big fan of. Uh, the AT2020, that's Audio Technica. That uh, is a pretty popular starter mic. Uh, going on the other end, the Neumann U87, you know, that's a popular tube style mic. It's expensive, but it uh, it does sound really good. They tend to have a cardioid pattern, which means that they're going to pick up pretty much everything except what's right behind them. So they capture a lot of nuance, and it's good for performance because it makes you sound great, and you can capture all those little performance things that are really nice. But it can also capture a ton of background noise. Like, it does not let... Uh, it does not keep noise out very well. So if your space isn't very well isolated, I would not suggest one of these really. Um, be, in Because, yeah, it's just going to bring in a lot of more background noise. The next category is dynamic, which dynamic comes in various shapes and sizes. This is a much more versatile shape-wise category, but the most common ones are the Shure SM58, which is the classic on-stage mic, just the ball, the ice cream cone shape. Um, the SM7B, which is the, like, can kind of style one that you see on a lot of podcasts and stuff. And the uh, Electro Voice RE2020 is also a very common one. These are pretty good because they capture less room noise, you know? They, they pretty much are going to capture your voice. They tend to record very quiet, is why. Because the way that they function is different. Like, it's just different internals. And I looked it up at one point. Um, I don't remember the exact basics, but I did go into it a little bit earlier. But basically, they are physically moving stuff in there, whereas with the condenser, it's a lot more electrical happening. So they can record quiet, but if you have a proper preamp, like an external preamp or something like a fed head or a cloud lifter, then that can work a great deal. Um, they tend to have a blunt sound, like, not necessarily muffled, but they sound, like, very, like, industrial, I guess. I, 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 they're not bad. They're good for some stuff. And they are good if you're in an environment that isn't super well treated or isolated because they reject a lot of noise. Um, I'm just, I'm just personally not a fan of them for voiceover. They're great for on stage, and they can be good for podcasts, um, and radio, uh, but the big thing is that they kind of color the voice. They give it, like, it, a different texture and a different sound. So for voiceover, I prefer clean audio. I don't want them to have to be doing weird stuff in the EQ to make me sound, you know, natural. So I don't like to use dynamics for that reason, especially the Electra voice. Like, it sounds great. Um, if you ever watched Frasier, like, that's the mic they use at the radio station in that show, and it sounds awesome. But it's, that's for radio, we're doing voiceover specifically, so it's up to you. They're not necessarily a problem, just keep that in mind, you know? If you get one of these, it's going to have its own distinct sound. And all mics will, but it's definitely going to have more present sound than anything. Uh, the next one I'm just mentioning briefly, because it's not a common one, and honestly, actually not a great one to go with. Uh, ribbon mics. Ribbon mics are beautiful. They make great sounds. They're a very classic style of mic, um, but they're incredibly expensive. Like, they can get up into the tens of thousands of dollars, and they're incredible 
incredibly delicate. They record with a ribbon, like a little ribbon that will wear out over time. Like they are not a forever, like you have to replace that ribbon and the ribbons are super expensive. And like, if you do the wrong thing with your audio, you raise the gain too much. You ever use them with phantom power. It's like, it's, it's going to be bad. So my advice, and this is my advice for buying anything. If you can tell me why you need one, then you should get it. But if you can't tell me, if you don't know why you need one, specifically why you need one, a, a ribbon mic over a different mic, you don't need one. Simple as that. It's, that's really any, per like, until you're at the level where you understand why you need it, you don't need it. So, um, let's move on to the uh, cigar slash lipstick style condenser, which is what I'm using right here. Uh, let me move my head. Yeah, yeah, you can see. It's just like a little tube, you know, and it has a, um, hold on, uh, it's basically, pull this off, it's basically just a tube with a little grill on the end. Hopefully you can still hear me, but it's just like that. And um, technically I don't need the puff ball because I don't get too many plosives with my placement like this, but uh, I like to have it for safety. Oh, and to be clear, uh, puff balls like this, um, uh, this one specifically, this is just your standard like dynamic one. I just turn it inside out so that it fits the smaller mic. But uh, puff balls like that, I prefer just because you don't have to fill with them like a pop filter. And honestly, if you do uh, my uh, tip I have later, you don't necessarily need one. I just like to have it for safety. I don't want to gamble with like, I know I don't necessarily need one and I won't get plosives with the proper placement, but I don't want to have that one time where I accidentally have a plosive and then I look like an amateur to a client. So it's for protection against that. This specific one is the MXL 991, which you can get in a package with the MXL 990. And it is super cardioid. So whereas the, um, the other mics were cardioid where it, gets like most of it except for right behind it this gets much narrower stuff in fact it looks like a literal heart like some of they look kind of more like a kidney bean even though cardioid is supposed to be heart uh with the super cardioid it looks exactly like a heart and so it's gonna mostly pick up from here and not much from the outside so this one has a very low noise floor and it's pretty quiet but it'll still pick you up nicely and it sounds pretty good. And for someone like me who has a higher voice, it's pretty good for that. Um, if you have a lower voice, it might not be able to capture some of the rich bass that you might have. Knowing voiceover actors. Oh God, I sound awful. Ugh. I've been talking for like an hour. Come on, give me a break. I can't sound so sultry. Um, but it blocks out more noise from the sides, so it helps in places with lighter treatment. That's why I use it here, because, like, I have very light treatment in this room. Some, you know, moving blanket, regular blanket, little futon thing tacked up. Most of the stuff back there isn't actually doing much, but it's doing a little bit. And with this, this can do it. If I if I shout, it's not going to work as well. But for just talking naturally for a stream or YouTube, works fine. Works fine with proper placement. I, if I if I was doing like a, a small narration thing, like I've said before, or even just like a regular commercial thing, or if I was doing like some kind of ADR background character thing where it's not as important, it's not a main character, I might do it on here. It might not matter if it's a background character. Um, it's up to the project head. And if it's your project, then it's up to you. Um last one I want to talk about because there's a lot of miscellaneous other weird ones and I'll mention those briefly uh, shotgun mics shotgun mic is very long and thin and these are what they use on movie sets uh, that's what when they have the boom arm the boom is actually the arm and the mic is just called the boom mic because it's on the boom but it's just a shotgun mic and they're pointing it down it's not perfect you know it doesn't actually like work perfectly all the time it's not a laser beam of sensitivity, but 
it will work very well and it will block out a ton of the noise. It's hypercardioid, so it's very narrow. So if you go off to either side even a little bit, it's gonna knock out a lot of that. Um, cuts a ton of noise from the side, great for spaces with background noise or spaces that have a little less treatment. So if you're on the road or something and you have to make a makeshift booth for a client, this works great. Or if you record in your car, because in reality, a car can be a good space. They're designed to block out like highway noise. So if you find a quiet place and you, you know, cover the windows with like some materials or whatever, you can record in a car and it can sound great. A lot of national commercials have been recorded in cars with a shotgun mic. So um, it's good for impromptu stuff. Some drawbacks would be it can make you sound really bassy which, depending on your voice, could sound great, could be kind of muddy, and you might not want that. And so if, you, if you're if you a normal distance away, it, yeah, I don't know. It, the sound depends on your voice and everything. That's all of these, which I'll get into in a minute, but it's like your people's voices are unique, mics are unique, so it depends on you. I personally have not been using a shotgun mic, but I'm looking into getting one. Uh, some of the ones to get would be the Sennheiser MKH-216. Or wait, is it the Shure MKH-216? I don't remember. I just remember the letters and the numbers. My apology. But if you just look up MKH-216 microphone, you'll find it. It's very expensive, but it is an industry standard, and it sounds good. Uh, the alternative, which is a newer thing, is the Cinco Mic D2, which, according to some reviews I've seen, is indistinguishable and only costs 250 bucks, which, for microphones, is really affordable. That's, that's really good, especially if it's at, like, a $2,000 mic level of quality. So, that's something to keep in mind. Now, there are other miscellaneous non-recording mics you can use these for other stuff, but I'm just going to briefly talk about them since I'm talking about microphones. Teleconference mics, like the uh, Samson Go mic I have here, which is mostly for teleconferencing, sometimes for other things. Oh, there's a Cinco D1 now. Hmm. I might look into that. It's a good question. Um... 416? Did I not say 416? 216. My bad. Yes, it is the MKH 416. I don't have one, so I don't remember, but people mention it quite often. Uh, thank you for catching that. But yeah, you have teleconference mics like this. It's itty bitty. You know, it's got two sides. You can switch it to like uh, omnidirectional, so it'll record all the way around. It's got like a little clip to clip it onto your laptop or your desk, and it's flippy, and, and it's got USB. It's fine. I, I don't use it for recording voiceover, but it's it's good for teleconferencing if you cannot get your better mics to connect to certain programs, which happens every now and then to me, so I have to use that. Um, or just for YouTube and stuff, I guess. Or if you just want to, like, impromptu record, like, a conversation for a podcast or something, just plop it on a table. It's not going to sound great, but it works. You can find a lot of teleconferencing mics that do stuff like that. That would probably be the one I'd suggest. It's, like, 40 bucks. Sounds fine. It's pretty well suited for that. Um, headsets. I would not record with these. Um, which I'll get into why later. But for the most part... Most of the money is going towards the headphones, so the mic is definitely an afterthought with headsets. And then lapel mics, which are the little, like, mic that you clip to your shirt or whatever or get taped to you. Um, that's for, like, TV and stuff. And it's good for YouTube so that you don't have to have a mic in your face. You can just have that on, and it can sound fine. Uh, those have a whole other thing going for them and so many accessories and things, so... You can you can look at that yourself. I, I, I'll just mention that they exist. So, moving on. I'm going to get a sip of water real quick. Ah. Agua. Hmm. Actually, I'm also going to get a little spritz of my Entertainer's Secret throat spray. Ah. 
I apologize. I'm so used to editing out nasty human noises like that, but in this case, I uh, don't have the luxury. Maybe on YouTube. I'm not going to go into that much work. I'm, I do very light edits on these for YouTube, so... Okay, moving on to the next section. Part six, what mic should you get? And like I said, it depends on your voice. No one mic sounds great with everybody. You just got to experiment because like your voice could sound great with a, a cheaper mic and terrible with a really expensive mic. Who knows? Um, one thing, you can watch reviews, but so many reviews are just dudes with the deep, fun voice like that. So their reviews might not work for you. Like me personally, I don't have that deep voice. I can get kind of deep, but it's like, for the most part, I'm going to sound kind of teenage, so... <clears throat> Excuse me. For the most part, I'm going to sound pretty high-pitched teenage, so those mics won't work for me. I've had to experiment, so just, you know, abuse the return policy. Go to, like, Guitar Center or a local store or online if you can. It's just going to be easier to return it if it's in person. Um, and just get mics, take them home, try them out. Don't try them out in the store because you need to know what they sound like in your space that you've hopefully isolated and treated very well so that it sounds good. Um, and then also, like, different mics will work differently with different interfaces. So keep that in mind, too. So you just have to experiment. There's no one answer. I can say, though... You do want to experiment, but here's some ones that you can mark off the list right now. You do not need to get because they are terrible. The newer NW800. Do not get this. This microphone is $20 for a reason. It's on uh, Amazon. It's usually like blue and silver. It looks like a U87. It looks like the tube style, but it's a piece of garbage. It sounds terrible. It's just tinny. It's super noisy. It's super tuby. It just sounds really, really bad. Do not get it. Don't waste your money on this thing. Even 20 bucks. It's like you may as well just be burning a $20 bill because you're not going to be able to use this microphone. It's unusable. Blue brand USB mics. Do not use these. Some of their XLR mics are good. Once you get into the higher ranges, they have some good ones. Like the blue bottle rocket is pretty nice. And uh, a few others but the usb ones are overpriced for the quality of the components think about it the blue yeti is a little over hundred dollars and has three capsules why not just get a mic that has one good capsule instead of splitting the cost among three cheap capsules it's awkward to use it has a weird shape and a weird stand um i know you can like adapt it for a mic stand but like it, that's such a pain um it has a ton of superfluous features you'll never need. Like, you don't need omnidirectional, bidirectional, all of that. You just need cardioid for voiceover. And, like, most of that stuff, even if you want to do, like, podcasting and stuff, it's better to just get multiple mics so that you have separate tracks and stuff. So, I don't know. I, the main thing is it makes you look like you did no research. Because if you did, you would have known not to get one. You would have known immediately that you shouldn't have got one because they're super overpriced and they're just not very good for the price. If you can get them used, maybe, to play around with. I might get a used one someday if I can get one really cheap, which is really easy because there's people getting them and then realizing it was a mistake and selling them. So the resale market for them is pretty good, pretty cheap. I would not spend more than, like, 40 bucks on like a blue yeti use but i would not get one at all i'd get one mainly just to do a breakdown of exactly why it's bad and then sell it off again but i'm just gonna say don't get one it's a waste of time the main thing that they're designed for is just to look like a mic icon like if you look at a mic icon on most software they look like the blue yeti and i feel like that's why they did that so that it could look like that but that's that's it, it it's aesthetic but it's it's trash bad mic bad mic USB mics in general, they get decent when you get over like 200 bucks. Like some of those are really good. But at that point, you could just get a decent XLR mic and a decent interface instead. So why not do that? It's more expandable. If you get the interface, you only need to get another mic later. Whereas eventually you're going to need to get an interface if you want to do this seriously. So why not do it? 
Headsets. I don't know why anybody thinks these are acceptable. The fact that people are still auditioning for stuff using a headset is bizarre to me. Why they think that it's acceptable. You can't have good placement because it's right here. You can't you can move it up and down maybe a little bit, but it's like it's right next to your face. It's terrible placement. Tons of plosives because again, it's right on your face. Um, maybe if it's one of the ones up here, but then it's like it's barely getting all your voice. It's got a terrible bass response. There's just no bass coming through. Just no. Awful. Awful. Sounds bad. All it's designed is so that people can hear you when you're gaming or teleconferencing. It's not designed for recording because it sounds bad when it's recording. No matter how expensive it is, all the money's going into having good audio to hear in the headphone portion, not good audio going out in the mic portion. <clears throat> no, just don't get a headset. <laughs> Unless you just want a game, at which point, like, most of this is unimportant for you. All right. Number seven, how do you use your equipment? So, you've gotten decent equipment. You've experimented. First things first, read your manuals. Way too many people don't read the manual, which is... I, I don't get it. Like, if you're not excited to learn everything about the thing you just got, why'd you get the thing? Like, the most exciting thing to me when I get anything is to read the manual and learn everything that I can do now. That's so cool. So, like, reading the manuals helps a great deal. It teaches you a lot. Um, but after you read the manuals, once you have your isolation and treatment in place, sounds good. And you have your... Uh, quick thing to check if your isolation is good, just clap your hands. And you can tell if it's reverberant. It's a little reverberant in here because it's not super well treated. It would be way worse if I didn't have any treatment set up, but thankfully I have a little bit to cut down. And then it would be even better in there. I've actually done videos where I have a comparison of that, so you can go to my YouTube and check those out. Um, but yeah, once you have your isolation and treatment in place, you connect your mic to your interface. Just XLR into one end of the mic, XLR into the audio in on the interface. Turn on phantom power if your mic needs it. Do not turn it on if you don't need it because you will blow your microphone. It will destroy the capsule. And in the case of ribbon microphone, the ribbon will literally explode. Like it won't be necessarily dangerous, but it will be useless. So do not use phantom power if you don't need it. it does not give any extra benefits. Um, it's just if you need it. So, <coughs> excuse me. The next thing, make sure you're talking into the correct part of your mic. There's two types of microphones. There is end address, like this, where the capsule is at the end of the microphone, so it's pointing straight at my mouth right now. Side address, which is usually the condenser mics. It will be straight up and down. On the side, the capsule will be, like if this was your microphone, XLR cable would be coming from the bottom, and then the side address. Usually where the logo is. If you're not sure where the capsule is, usually wherever the logo is on the mic is going to be lined up with the capsule. Um, if you speak into the wrong part, it's not going to hear you correctly, so you'll sound muffled and quiet. Usually if you sound muffled and quiet, it's because you're speaking into the mic incorrectly. This is why people sound awful when they seem to think they should talk into the top of a Blue Yeti. Like, they will... You will see so many videos of people who have a Blue Yeti, and it's pointed up at their face, but it's a sight address mic, so they should be talking into the side of it. I mean, even if they used it properly, it wouldn't sound good, but I digress. Placement. Placement is the next thing. This is what will make your mic sound even better. So to place it, make a hand like this. Hang loose. Or Y if you're a... Uh, if you know ASL, but you take your hand like that, put your thumb against your lips, like so, and put your pinky against the grill of your mic, right where the capsule is. That's about perfect distance. So once you do that, then you turn yourself, in this case, an inch or two to the side, or turn your mic an inch or two to the side and point it at your mouth. Now, your voice is still hitting it because it goes out all in a sphere out from your mouth, but your breath is going this way, so it's not going to pop 
on the capsule, even if you have a pop filter or this, if I talk directly into the mic, I'm going to pop it quite a bit because the air is still able to get through. By doing this, you don't even necessarily need a pop filter, but it can still be good as a backup. And if you're doing like a teleconferencing call that's directed, um, it can make you look more professional to have a pop filter, which can be important. Looks are important in, uh, in the entertainment industry. So one thing, if you're in a less treated space, like I am, you can just use a fist about there. You can be a little closer because you want to get your voice into the mic before the reflections get in there. If you're using a more powerful mic like a shotgun or you're going to shout, use two hands. Go way back. And that will hopefully stop you from popping the mic too much. Uh, if you still do, you got to turn your gain down. But gain will be next. Um, num, 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 num. Okay, so find the gain knob for your input on your interface. If you have multiple inputs, you got to figure out which one it is. Talk into your mic and turn the gain knob up until the loudest parts of your voice, the highest parts, are hitting between negative 20 and negative 10 decibels. I know that sounds quiet. Negative three is the industry standard. Negative three is the standard for finished audio. For recording, negative 20 to negative 10. That'll capture any nuance, and it will prevent you from clipping, and it'll keep your background noise down. So if you have high background noise, if you lower it down to this range, you have less background noise. So it's a lot better. And your engineer will thank you for the headspace. Because if it's already almost to the top, I can't do anything with that. It's too loud. Like, you're going to clip it, or even if you don't clip it, it's going to be that. You can always turn it up later in editing, and it does not do anything distracting or destructive to the audio to turn it up. So, negative 20 to negative 10. That's the region you want your peaks to be. Ah! I keep spilling my water on myself. I need to get a better water bottle. I don't like the straw ones, though. I don't know. They don't feel less hydrating? Or something. I can't describe it. Ah, but yes, that that is how you set up your microphone. So once you do that, you can watch my last uh, stream to see how to actually record in Audacity or whatever program, or you can just look up how to record in your software, Audacity, Reaper, Pro Tools. There's hundreds, hundreds of tutorials, so you'll find one that can tailor to your specific situation. So, moving on. Part eight, how much should I budget? So, when you're first starting out, if you have no equipment, no treatment, anything, an acceptable setup, mic interface treatment, is going to cost about 300 to 500 bucks. If you want to do this professionally, that is a tiny investment. That's a tiny business investment, 300 to 500 bucks. If you don't want to do it professionally, save up, you know? Don't waste your money on a bunch of cheap mics, spending $20 here, 50 bucks there, uh, hoping that you'll upgrade to a big one eventually. No, no, no. Just instead, save that $70 and then wait until you have enough to get better equipment from the start. It'll take you a little longer to start up, but it'll be worth it in the end. Um, it's doing something weird to Sailor Moon's face. I, know, I got all these wet spots because I keep spilling my water on myself. Oh, I'm a mess. Okay. So, don't skimp on the treatment. Spend a majority of your, more than half, literally a majority of your budget on it. It will be worth it, trust me. Like, make your treatment the best you possibly can afford. And you don't even necessarily have to get materials. Like, there are ways to get decent treatment with just household items. You can use couch cushions. You can use just random bags and luggage, plush toys, just sacks of, like, packing peanuts. There are things you can do, but just, like, don't skimp on the treatment. If you have great treatment... Then you won't need to. Then it will save you money in the long run because you won't need to have as hardcore of other equipment, because you'll sound good 
even on cheaper equipment. Get your interface and mic used. eBay has buyer protection and some great deals. Most mics can be like 60, 70% off used. And yeah, if they tell you that it, like just, if you're worried, ask the seller directly, does this work? If they say yes, and you get it and it does not, eBay will refund you. It is on them. Like eBay is really good about that. So it might be a pain, but this is the best way to get decent equipment. I got my interface used. It was like 200 bucks instead of the like 600 it would be new. Um, I got my mics new, but I mean, I would have only saved like 50 bucks on that for the most part. Um, I'm waiting to find a deal on a, a CAD E100S, which is also a very good mic for starters. Um, but you can find those like two to 300 bucks used. It's like 600 new. So used, used is fine. Like you can find good deals and you should, but overall you should be able to make a good working setup that you could use for professional jobs three to five hundred bucks if you have more spend more like it will be an investment in good audio and if the better your audio is the more the less likely you are to not get jobs it's not necessarily going to get you jobs just having good audio but you will lose jobs if you have bad audio and you're trying to get them so it's an investment and it's worth it so here we come finally to part nine, the conclusion. Remember, your audio has to go through your space and your interface before your mic. Don't bottle yourself, like don't bottleneck yourself by skimping on either of those. A solid interface and great treatment will last you through tons of budget mics. You can spend 50 bucks on a used mic and if you spend a couple hundred bucks on good treatment, good interface, you can have great pro audio. Now, obviously, you'll have to upgrade your mic eventually, but if you have those other things, then you won't have to be upgrading them as well. If they are already at a good level, you can just get a better mic when you can afford one, and it'll do great for you. So just remember, it's an investment in your business and or your passion. Hopefully, if it's your business, it's also your passion. Maybe it's just your passion and you don't want to do it as a business, but you are investing in that. And if it's something you're passionate about, you should want to invest in that. Like you should take that just as seriously as if it's a job. We only have so many things we can do in this world. So if you're passionate about something, you should do it the best you can because we only have so much time to do the things we want to do. So that is the conclusion to my stream. So I'm probably not going to stay on too much longer, but I am reading the chat. So if anybody has any specific questions that I have not already answered, then feel free to put a question in the chat and I'm going to read back through to see if there's any that I didn't answer specifically. And I will answer your questions. Let's see. So yeah, I need a new interface strictly for VO, only one channel needed. Um, thanks, June. See you later. Um, let's see. New interface strictly VO, only one channel needed. Yeah, the Audion ID4 is probably pretty good. Like, uh, again, if you get these things used, that's pretty good. Um, the Scarlet 2i2, you can get the smaller one. Uh, depending on what kind of computer you have, whether it's Mac or PC, you could get the Apollo Solo, and you can find these for like a couple hundred, three hundred bucks, which, again, it, in audio equipment terms, <clears throat> in audio equipment terms, that's cheap. That's like really affordable. Audio equipment is super expensive, super expensive. So, to the th under 500 bucks is basically budget so definitely definitely don't skimp out on that if you can um in terms of laptop i said earlier mac is really good for voiceover kind of work audio work so it might be good to get one of those if you can afford it um 
the main thing is that you just have a decent processor. Like, you don't have to go crazy for audio, as long as you're not, like, totally skimping out on the computer. Uh, for the most part, your interface is your sound card, so as long as your interface is good and your computer isn't a complete pile of garbage, you can use it. Um, the cheapest thing for a computer is to build your own. It, it always has been. So if you want a good computer for cheap, learn how to make your own. It's not as daunting as it once was because, like, a lot of stuff just goes together like Lego, honestly, at this point. Like, making your own computer, if you look up a tutorial, super easy, super safe. You're not super likely to, like, destroy anything if you're smart about it. And you can save a few hundred bucks, maybe even close to a thousand bucks. Like, you can get the best gaming PC there is if you build it yourself about $1,500, which it'll last you a few years, like probably upwards of six years. Um, so it's definitely, definitely worth it to do that. But again, audio, you don't need to do too much. I would say not knowing your specific situation, get, get a decent enough computer, you know, not like a cheapo one, make it yourself if you can, cause it'll be cheaper. Um, and then, Interface wise, honestly, just get the ID audience like ID 14 or like the ID 4. But like, if you get the 14, there's just another slot that you can expand to use for other stuff. Like, it's you can get it for like about 200 bucks used, and that's pretty affordable for a really good interface. Um, the Scarlett 2i2, pretty good. Like, even if you are having problems with the oh, what interface did you say you have? What did you say? What did you say? There's one you said that you had a problem with. Um, focus right solo. Yeah, the the Scarlet Two I Two is supposed to be better, so I would definitely give it a check. Um, you know, don't. As I said, don't skimp out. Like, as long as you are looking at reviews and stuff and double checking that it's not cheap if you can find actual recordings with the audio um hopefully with someone who sounds at least in your like vocal range like pitch wise you should be good like once you get above the standard it's mostly small adjustments that you get like there's a lower standard and stuff under that is going to be pretty much unusable but once you get over the like hundred fifty, two hundred dollar range for interfaces, they're gonna be able to do fine. Um, if you have a Mac, maybe an Apollo Solo could be good. That's single interface and it's supposed to be pretty good. Um, if you want the best bang for your buck, I didn't mention this because it's my own personal thing. Getting a a Zoom H5 portable recorder. Because it can work as an interface, a pretty decent interface, and it can record straight to SD cards, which is great. I love that, and I use it all the time. It has two interfaces, or uh, rather, it has two XLR inputs on the bottom. It has, like, another separate proprietary thing on top so that you can have, like, a built-in mic um, and all sorts of accessories for that. So it's, yeah, it's it's really cool. I've never regretted getting it. I use it all the time. It's like 250 bucks or something, but you're getting a, a recorder and you're getting a mic, which is not the best mic for voiceover, but you can use it in a pinch. If you have good, if you again have good treatment, you could technically use that one for voiceover. Um, and it's also an interface, a pretty decent, very portable interface. Uh, so I, I would honestly suggest getting that and if you use that, you honestly don't even need to use your computer to record. You can just record to that and then just use the SD card. Um, just stick the SD card or just the USB over so that it's an SD card reader and just get the files over to uh, edit them. And that is uh, something I do quite often in my YouTube videos. When I'm recording over there... That pink thing back there, if you ever watch my movie reviews on my YouTube channel, I'm just in front of that. That That's doing nothing for treatment, by the way. It's, like, paper thin, so it, it does nothing for treatment. It just looks cool as a backdrop. And uh, 
yeah, I'll just loop a mic from the portable recorder and then bring it over and do all that. So it's very useful for a lot of applications. Of course, I use a lot more than just voiceover. If you're doing just voiceover specifically, you can go less on that, but I don't know. You'll probably find a way to use it. If, if you are passionate about audio, you'll probably find a use for it. So it's worth getting. So no new questions looks like. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to anybody who watches this after the fact. I, uh, I appreciate you tuning in. This is still a very, very small channel, but I'm doing my best to build it up and make it good. Uh, I did figure out how to get my Elgato to work in OBS. By figure out, I mean it just works now. It, it, it would crash before, and I couldn't get an explanation, and suddenly it just, now it just works, and there's no explanation for that either. But whatever, I'm going to be streaming a lot of Nintendo Switch games and a lot of other stuff, doing some fun voices, getting some friends in, probably do some silly stuff, you know? Um, so, tune in for that. Thanks for watching, guys. Good night.